Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Hey guys, my name is Yehuda. Uh, the there he goes again refers to the fact that I'm going to be doing some live coding at the end of this, but not the whole time. Um, also, the live coding is going to be more audience directed, so it's going to be more showing you random features and not trying to achieve something. It's probably going to help. My audio is very distorted. Move my mic down. Okay, does this help? Hello, is this better? All right, cool. So, um, my name is Yehuda. I work at Engine Yard. I work on uh, jQuery, Data Mapper, and Merb, which are killer stacks. Pretty much showed this before. So, basically, I work on all the technologies that I re usually talk about. Um, gives me a good perspective to talk about how they work together and basically how to actually use them for real things. Uh, some things about Merb, Merb is fast. Um, pretty much, there you, you can choose when you make a framework between fast um, and elegant and Waves does functional programming. You can try to make choices and it seems today that if you make, or people have made the claim that choosing speed, sorry, choosing speed automatically means you lose elegance or you lose other things. Uh, it turns out not to be a zero sum game. Um, it turns out that if you, if you decide up front that you're gonna be fast and elegant, that it's possible to do it. Um, but that it requires a significant amount of thinking and work, and we do that. Um, basically, slow is not allowed in Merv. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I know inject is slow, but you should just do that and boot up or something. Um, it turns out that when you write code in a framework, especially an open source one, it is extremely hard to figure out in advance what code is going to make its way into the critical path. So if we said, oh yeah, we'll allow super slow stuff in boot up, some guy is going to make a patch sometime down in the future where he copies some code out of the boot up and puts it somewhere else, and everybody else will say, sounds good, looks like it comes from up elsewhere in the framework. So we pretty much don't allow flow code anywhere in the framework, which leads to really fast code. Um, leads to verb requests rendering in 500 microseconds. Um, it leads to things like, it seems like controller setup cookies. There is 75 microseconds. That seems like a lot. It is a lot. It's going to get smaller. But it's good when you're thinking about things like 75 microseconds is a lot. That means something. That means that. Um, your app has a lot more headroom than other things. It means, that, um, it means that your app will be able to actually do things. Um, it, let me rewind. So, <laughs> so Merb is frequently used for things like ad networks, where you get 10 million hits a day or 20 million hits a day. In fact, there are Merb apps running today that get in the tens of millions of hits per day. Um, that's only possible because it's possible to write Merv actions that render in less than a millisecond. It's not actually possible to write Rails actions that render in less than a millisecond because the Rails stack is two or three milliseconds. So what else about Merv? So there's this thing called the public API. Um, that sign over there is sort of what has happened to Rails. So you have to decide when you're making an app. Usually in most languages, you have to decide what the public API that you're going to expose to the users is. And a lot of languages like Java provide facilities where you can say, this is private and you can't touch it. And thankfully, Ruby doesn't do that. Ruby actually lets us experiment and do all sorts of interesting things with things that, are, that the person who wrote the original code might consider private. And what that lets us do is it lets us say, OK, here's a bunch of code, and it lets other people write plugins or experiment and come back and say, hey, Without having to write, recompile, or do any sort of, in, um, without having to do any sort of hard work to get it running, they can simply at runtime make some changes, see what happens, and then come back and say, "Hey, here's, you should make this change." But that doesn't mean that we should give up on the notion of what an API is, right? So Merv has a strong sense that there is an API that Merv intends you to use, 
made up of all the public methods in MERB. And there's also a bunch of other methods that MERB uses internally, and you should not use those methods. Um, obviously, that doesn't, like I just said, that doesn't make them verboten for experimentation. But it does mean that there's a contract with our users that we make. You only use the public API. We won't change it. And we're going to make it super robust. What that means is that if you find something that you can't do with the public API, we'll get, we're going to make sure that you can do it. Um, usually when I say that, someone says, really, anything? The answer is probably not anything. Yeah. But our mission is to, make, is to not use Ruby as an API. It's not to sort of expose all, all corners of the API and then let you do whatever you want and then forever maintain every private method as an API, which is sort of Rails' position right now. Um, because of the fact that people have overridden you know, the way that Rails looks up dependencies in order to add special functionality, Rails can't change the way they look up dependencies anymore without breaking people's apps. Right? So we're, gonna, we're trying to avoid that. But we're committing strongly to, if there's something that you want to do that's relatively sane, adding it. One example of that is Merv made an assumption for the first two years of its existence that templates came out of files seemed like a really good assumption. Um, and then one day someone said, I want to put templates at the bottom of my controllers. So I saw this in Sinatra. It seemed cool. And our first reaction was, that seems crazy. But then our second reaction was, why are we making an assumption about files without templates being the files? And it turned out that by modifying our API so that it no longer made that assumption, we didn't have to add a lot of, it was you know, a couple lines of code. We changed the way our assumptions worked. All that code was already private. Um, and we were able to give this person a feature that he wanted without having to, without him doing what he initially wanted, which was alias method chaining render or something like that. That was his initial. He said, this was one of the times where someone came into the merge chat room and said, I came up with a really good reason I have to use alias method chain. If we don't like it, a lot of people, it's sort of like a challenge, come in and say, I found the reason why you need it. And this was one of them. And the solution was a very simple two-line change that changed the fundamental assumption about how MERB worked, but didn't break anybody's app. MERB is modular. Um, what that means is that pieces of MERB don't know about each other, really. That is sort of a fundamental way programs usually get written, but somehow, because Ruby is powerful and flexible, lots of code written in Ruby doesn't end up being modular. Um, it requires discipline, but what it means is that you can easily, if you want, swap in and out pieces of MERB, um, which leads to very hackable. That's Roomba. So Roomba actually decided that they are going to promote people hacking Roomba. So they could have not. Right? They could have said, this is Roomba. You can't touch it. They could have been Apple and said, if you open it up, you're in the food or something. But they didn't. They actually have a place on their site where you, you can download pictures of cockfighting Roomba. And that's actually sort of our, our same approach, which is make Merb, <laughs> make Merb as hackable as possible. Um, make it a framework that if you're a hacker and you want to make the change, it's going to be really easy. You're not going to have to go spelunking through the code base for several days trying to find something to be obvious, um, to be modular, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that came out of this is Merb slices. Um, what Merv slices are is a way of taking a, a, a piece of your app. So let's say you have you know, a blog, and it has the same three controllers, two models, a bunch of these, some routes, uh, packaging that all up into something that looks like a Merv app, and then distributing it as a gem. Uh, it actually ended up not requiring almost any changes to our public API. It required one change. This was a big feature. This was a, a Sort of a people wanted this in Rails forever. Engines sort of provides it, but breaks sometimes, and seems like a big hack. And so we were willing to make some changes to the public API, but it turned out we didn't need to um, because we already didn't make any assumptions about where files live or where controllers, models, or views should exist, or how and when to load classes. Um, and so everything just worked. And um, the person who wrote slices, who is currently doing a bunch of really interesting work in MERB, um, actually getting paid by engineer to do some things in MERB, uh, has said that without the way MERB's infrastructure, ar architecture worked, he wouldn't, be able, he wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think he wrote slices in like a few days or for sure under a week. So that's pretty cool. 
Um, and that's sort of a testament. This was the first testament. This is the first time where I knew for sure we were right about what we were trying to do. So people sometimes say, well, it sounds like you're getting all configurable on me. What's up with that? Do I need an XML file? And the answer is no. We like convention over configuration. So here's how Rails does convention over configuration. They have Rails, and then they splatter throughout Rails all the convention. So that's one way you could do it. You could say 80% of people want something done this way. We'll just hard code it into the framework. If controllers are supposed to be in app controllers, we'll just have it in the framework that it's an app slash controller. And we won't really have any notion of when you want to say app controllers go somewhere, it goes into a special place, which is the default place. MERB works differently. So MERB has MERB core, which has no defaults in it at all. So assumptions that you would assume would be true, like models are in app models, are, not, are nowhere to be found in MERB core. In fact, if you would download and install MERB core right now, um, you, would not, all the, you would not be able to make any sort of assumption about anything. You would have to pretty much start from the ground up. So yes, you would have not XML files, but a lot of configuration to do. But we're not idiots, right? It, it is true, as Rails proved, that a lot of people want the same thing. So we have layers on top that are sane and known, that are MERB more, which has a generator in it that generates files in a known configuration. Uh, it has some template engines. It has a whole bunch of stuff that adds features that sort of come with Rails, but in their own little boxes. And then we have a layer of defaults on top of that, which says, OK, most people actually want their things in app models. So we, we have one file, which is the bootloader, which, specify, which puts the defaults into place. And it's the bootloader, unlike Rails, which has this one giant method which says, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And it's just one line, like 40 lines or something. So basically, if you want to change the way Rails does stuff, you're going to have trouble. Um, the bootloader in MERV allows you to simply just say, OK, I don't actually want the load framework bootloader. So I won't have it. You just take it out. Um, and in fact, um, the active record plugin for MERV adds a bootloader into the bootloader list in a specific place where it needs to be, which adds its own level, its own set of defaults that obviously don't come with MERP. And that's sort of the way we like it. So that's sort of the, the philosophical treatise on what MERV is. And now I'm going to go into some cool features, and then I'm going to do some code. So first of all, the MERV router is pretty cool. Um, you can do stuff like this. Um, you can request, you can do request that anything. So what that route says is match slash foo, but only if the user agent matches MSIE. And what user agent matches MSIE means is request that user agent matches MSIE. You can also do really easy optional segments. Um, you can do, as you can see here, nested optional segments. So you don't have to do weird things with splats and simply put optional segments in parentheses and you're good to go. Um, we also have something called deferred routes, which is sort of the reason why this um, set of slides is in here. Deferred routes basically let you take a piece of code that is routing code, sort of related to the way where you want to go, and put it in the route, the router. Um, block of code that gets the request and the parameters. And we've actually, because of the fact that the session is not really part of the controller, it's just part of the request, you can even do request.session. So you could, over here you do, if request.session is logged in, then send you to main, you know, merge main in controller main with parameters, otherwise send you to login. Um, sort of uh, the request.session.login is also another um, interesting thing about MERV, which is that the session is the first level object. So um, in app model session, app model MERV session.rb, you can actually go in there and add methods to the session. Obviously, we'll have access to self. And actually do things like request.session.logged in instead of overloading helpers or your controller with things like logged in plus mark, which obviously would then make them inaccessible to the route. Okay. So, 1.0. One 1.0 is coming out October 11th. Um, I don't see any reason why. We announced that a couple weeks ago and it's, we're very much on target. Um, Verb Camp is October 11th and the goal is to release 1.0 by then. Um, some things that are in 1.0. Um, 
form builder with automatic client side validation. So like Rails, Merv has a form builder, but Merv's form builder is actually really powerful and easy to swap in other form builders without anybody noticing. Um, so Merv has a plugin called Merv jQuery that comes with Merv more. Um, which obviously, you can take out. Not, nothing is entangled into it. But part of Merv jQuery in 1.0 will be um, a form builder that when you say you know, input or text field foo, it will go in to data mapper and I guess Active Record could provide the same functionality if it wants to. Uh, that would look for validations and automatically add the appropriate metadata in without you having to do anything, um, which would automatically then give you client side validation. Uh, the router that I showed before, which didn't have like r dot blah blah or map dot blah blah, um, is part of a ground up rewrite of the router. Um, Mainly the mission of the new router was to provide better URL generation. So the existing router is really fast. Um, the initial mission for the router was for it to be super fast. It is super fast, but it is because of that, super fast and super powerful. Because of that, it's very hard to do URL generation, right? If you have user agents, MSIE, it's hard to figure out how you would go from um, a URL method and go to uh, something that's in the router. So it turns out to be really hard. Um, but it turns out that if you operate within a subset of the allowable routes, and we're trying to make the subset as big as possible, then you'll be able to generate routes from the client side. Um, we made a decision with the new routes not to, to, only, to not really support URL generation of anonymous routes. That may sound really scary. Um, Turns out that you should be in Rails also using named routes because they're much faster for URL generation. So like we're talking milliseconds of time that could be spent in a request with a lot of URL generation purely just generating routes because you have to go through a massive list and start figuring out what's going on and okay, which one is the least ambiguous or all sorts of crazy rules. So it turns out you should be using named routes and Merv is going to enforce that you should use named routes for URL generation with the exception of the default route, which has its own name called default. So you can do URL, and you can do like controller, foo, action bar, and that'll work fine because it's the default route. But otherwise, you should do the thing that's that. Um, something people have perhaps criticized Merv for, I think it's fair to criticize Ruby web framework for this, is that it's really hard to figure out how to test things. Uh, Merv has some nice things in it, like the fact that you can make, you can uh, instantiate controllers easily. You can do controller.new, and then you can call an action, and it's a method, and returns a string. Cool. But we still don't have a clear testing strategy. Um, there's a bunch of people doing Merv apps, though, and we're all testing our apps. So before 1.0, we'll get together and sort of form up what appear to be the best practices. Um, this is definitely going to need to be something that I don't know what to say because it seems like obvious that we as a community are, care about testing, but it seems like there's big holes in what exactly we care about and how likely we are to actually test in a way that... So in, in my view, testing should be um, that when you find a bug, when you create a bug, a test fails, and when you do not create a bug, a test doesn't fail. And we're nowhere near that in the Ruby community. Um, pretty much all testing strategies produce um, test failures when there's no bugs, and we need to not do that. So hopefully the Merv testing strategy will be closer to that, but I think we need to step up as a community and get closer to that ideal. Uh, there's also going to be something called Merv stack. So Merv, another criticism of Merv is, like I said, oh my god, XML, which we don't have, but oh my god, configuration. I have to know about all these gems that are in Merv more and what I need. and it's going to take me days to even figure out to begin what I need. And it seems like everyone's doing the same thing anyway, so what are you guys doing? So um, we agree that it's, it would be good to have one thing that if you wanted to just get up and running, it would work. And everyone would probably do that. So there's going to be this thing called Merv Stack. It's going to be a meta gem. It'll include jQuery and Data Mapper. Um, and we'll also include a generator that will generate, that will sort of pre-fill in the configuration for you so you don't need to figure out exactly what all the gems are. Um, what's kind of nice about Merv Stack, though, is that if you, in the, after you know, generating Merv Stack, would want to change, your, change up what you're doing, it would be pretty easy, uh, because it's just sort of pre-filled in generation, so pre-filled in configuration. 
So if you're like, oh, I don't actually want Hamel, it will be really easy to take it away. Um, like I said, much better URL generation. This is, as I said before, sort of a combination of restricting URL generation to named routes and then making URL generation through named routes as powerful as possible. Again, because we do things like matching um, user agents and doing deferred routes, it becomes super hard, uh, but we're trying to make it as, as good as possible. Um, a really interesting, promising thing that we sort of spiked out and now are on the fast track to getting into Merv is, so Fusion Passenger is cool because Fusion Passenger lets you do fast restart. They have all these forking tricks which they use and because of the fact that they fixed the forking problem in Ruby with Ruby Enterprise Edition, they can do all these interesting um, techniques for deploying Rails. But we don't want Apache. So well, most of Merv people don't want Apache. So, but they released this open source Ruby Enterprise Edition. So what, we're, what we've been working on is getting a lot of techniques that are in Fusion Passenger into Merb proper. So one example is that when you load up Merb uh, in 1.0, it'll, assuming you have Fusion Passenger installed, otherwise this would be a bad idea, um, it'll fork right before all your classes are loaded. So it'll start off your app and then it'll fork off. Um, and then it'll, the parent process will just chill out uh, right before it forked off, waiting for a signal. And then the child process will go on and do its thing like it works right now. And so far, everything would be moving along as expected as Merv and Rails work today. But then if you sent a hang-up signal to Merv to the child process, uh, the child process would exit. The parent process would be reawakened and fork again from that initial point. So in case that wasn't clear, what that means is that you'll be able to tell Merv restart quickly and it will reload any file. So you can do a you'll be able to do a deploy, totally change the files that are in the tree, tell Merv to restart, and instead of having to restart from the beginning, load all your gems and all that stuff, it would start just from the point where it has to load your classes, which would be fast restart. Um, we're also going, we're also looking into, and this is tricky across all the servers, uh, being able to manage a whole cluster through one pro through one parent process. So we already have this working for Mongrel. Um, and Swift apply. But what this means is that instead of a parent process, instead of, um, if you want a cluster, having the initial process sort of shell out and make a bunch of, uh, of MERB, you'd have the initial process forking for four processes and be in charge of listening for the child processes getting killed, for instance, by Monit and making new ones. So what this means is that um, because you'd also fork from, in this case, you'd fork from a much later stage. So you'd fork from right after all your classes are loaded, but right before you actually bound to a port. Um, so what happens is you have a process, and all of a sudden it blows up to like 6,000 megabytes or something. And if you have, if you're using Monit, which most people are with God, um, your process will get killed. And what that means today, for like a Mongo cluster, is that your process gets killed and has to boot up from the beginning all over again, which means that there should be 5, 10, or 15 seconds where one of your processes doesn't work. Um, what happens instead is that because the parent process knows what's going on, it can simply just refork as soon as the process dies. So you have you have a child process that gets killed. Um, the parent process is like, okay, I received a sick child, make a new fork, and within you know probably 100 milliseconds, something you have a new process. So anyway, that all that stuff is courtesy of Fusion Passenger actually releasing Ruby as Ruby Enterprise, and I would encourage people interested in like long-lasting Ruby processes in general to strongly consider the possible benefits of forking actually working. I know it's been like a long time that forking hasn't worked in Ruby, so sort of the conventional wisdom about things is just don't fork, it seems like a crazy plan. But it actually works with, with Ruby Enterprise. So it seems like something worth considering. Um, another thing that we're doing with forking is um, code reloading sucks in everything. Because um, because Ruby has side effects, if you, if you say require some file, um, who knows what it does? It might require another file that will do crazy things. And you can't really just say like unload the constant that that file. Rails sort of enforces this notion that you can only put a controller in a controller file. But as probably everyone in this room knows, if you by mistake don't do that, very scary and bad things happen. Um, 
Merb sort of tries to get it better by tracking what contents are loaded when you load a file. But even that, it's very, it's, it's impossible to track every single possible side effect. So what we're doing now is in development mode. Uh, and this is fine in MRI also because you can't, it doesn't really matter um, how much, how big your development process is. Um, so we fork um, really early again. Um, and then if we detect that a file is loaded, we just kill the child process and start again. And Ruby loads in less than the amount of time it takes to switch back to your browser. So what that means is that you have actual reloading that is perfect and foolproof. Again, something that, because forking is sort of a verboten concept in Ruby, people haven't thought of. But once we started thinking about what forking let us do, we came up with a lot of really interesting ideas. So I'm going to do some live coding. Well, here's what I mean by live coding. Um, I'm going to make a Merb app, and I'm going to show you. So I considered doing slides here. I considered showing you, OK, so an action returns a string, and hoping that you would understand what that means. But it's actually really hard. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to make an app, and I'll do some things, hopefully directed by people wanting to know what things work. And then hopefully you'll know what's going on. So let me re-mirror my face. Before I do that, are there any questions? This is MERB 09.5, or sort of 09.6 head. So MERB right now is on a two week release cycle. Um, usually the weekend is the release, so today or tomorrow there's going to be a release of MERB 09.6. Um, and so things like the new router are probably not going to be merged in 09.6, but will probably be in 09.7. So pretty much everything I said in 1.0 is on the roadmap for a release between 0.9, 6, and 1.0. OK. So here I am at my terminal. So let's make a path. So first of all, if you say merb gen, I'll just sort of give up. Gives you generators. We used to use Ruby gen, but we stopped using Ruby gen because it has a dependency on access support. And access support is very scary when it finds its way into your app. And somehow that was happening sometimes. So some guy wrote a thing called Templator, and we started using it, and it gives us this. So if we say MervGen app, it, it'll tell us sort of what we can do. Is it big enough, by the way, or should I make it? Good. So here, so let's make an app, um, MervGen app, uh, Lone Star. So I'm making a flat app here because there's something interesting in it. So what a flat app is, because Merv has no, doesn't care what directories you put things in, um, Merv has, supplies a flat and very flat app, which could be a single file app or an app with a single file and directories like you use. So the reason I generated the flat app is to show you this thing, this template location thing, which Super wide, apparently. It's not an 80 character rule violation. It's a good fun. So, what template location, so basically what Merv does is instead of just assuming that your templates are in a specific location, Merv has a, a method called template location that gets called inside of the controller. By default, it means the exact same thing that Rails means by template location. But in Merv, um, you can override that if you want and make your templates whatever you want. This is one of the things that Merv slices uses to do whatever it wants. Um, you can use this in combination with Rails' template root. So we also have template root. We actually have template roots. I think Rails might have that now. Um, so you can use template location in combination with template roots to do a lot of interesting So here we are inside of a controller. And you can see that index just returns hello. So let me just turn on the mode process. So we do not actually appear to have a route. Yeah, I have to say controller. I don't actually have a controller. 
Okay, I'm gonna back out of the loan. So that was just I just generated that to show you the template location method. So I'm just gonna make a regular Merbap. Okay, so in a regular Merbap comes with the router, which comes with default route. Now let's make a controller. So, like I said, if you make a string here, if you say hello, and turn on mode, does what you would expect it to do. Says hello, right? Um, and this is just because if you do, we go into views, right? And we say hello here, hello from template. And we say render over here. Unlike in Rails, it doesn't do anything magical. It simply returns a string. Right, so it says hello from template. And if I was to do x equals render, and then I was to say something like render plus render, it's just going to say it twice. So it's a lot of times apparently. So, so that works. Um, you can also return back um, if you also if you do redirect. So let's make another method called. You know, Redirect it. Say hello. If I say redirect to slash lone star slash redirected, this works. Um, that also simply returns a string. So that sets like the header and whatnot, but it simply returns a string. So in while in Rails you would say redirect, you know, lone star redirected and return. Right, because in Rails this does something special. And then you might have other stuff here. So this doesn't really matter since we're at the end, but potentially we might have other stuff, so you might want to return. In Merv, we do the opposite. We say return, redirect. And that's because redirect also simply returns a string. Um, now, I'm going to do something that you would never do in a real app just to demonstrate something. So let's say I have a global. And it has awesome in it. And I render the global. Obviously, this is going to work. Right. Um, now, Merv has a facility called Run Later, which is simply a background thing. And you can say, you can put in there dollar $x push. So this global is going to get awesome push into it. And we're going to still return dollar $x. So I'm going to restart to make sure that my globals aren't. So what happens is that dollar $x over here gets awesome pushed into it. Um, but it happens in the background. So what run later does is it provides you a block that gets pushed into a background queue and you can do whatever you want in it. And if I keep running it, it keep running. like I said, I would not use a global in real life, but demonstrate something. Um, run later could be used for, for example, sending mail because it happens in a background thread. Um, there's a queue object that gets these run later blocks pushed onto them. You should not use it really for mission critical stuff because if your process dies, you lose the queue. So that sucks. But if you have if you have something that you want to happen immediately and you could potentially clean it up later, um, like you could easily determine that mail wasn't sent and therefore send it if your thing crashes, or if you have a thing that never crashes, which seems suspicious to me, um, then then you're good to go. It's it's useful for operations that need, that you want to happen in the background. You don't want to clog up your um, your render, so you want it to happen quickly, but you don't really care about um, you don't really care about the reliability of them. You're willing to accept a process dying before everything in the queue gets sent. So, so that's this is all cool. Um, what about exception handling? So let's say I raise an exception here. So I get an exception stack case, which is cool, and. The stack trace lets you specify what you want. If you say, you know, by default, it just shows you your app stack trace, and you can see inside of it. <coughs> um, but you can also turn on the stack trace from the framework, which will show you Merb stuff, and gems, which will show you anything from other gems like Mongrel. You could also turn on the stack trace for other things, which is like the Merb binary, and obviously turn on and off. So yeah, that's cool and. 
You can also see parameter sessions. If you don't have any cookies and name drops. So that's cool. But what if, so here's a common problem. So what if I want to trap exception and do something special? I want to send an email. So Merv has this thing called the exceptions control. And let's raise something more useful, like a not found. And let's go into exceptions. And we're not found. And let's replace this with uh, you are not found. So goes and renders that. That's fine. Um, and you can use this for anything. You can use you can catch any sort of error. Um, you can even catch regular errors. So you can catch standard error. Um, I'm going to show you something because the last time I showed this, people were confused as to how this works. And it seems magic, but it's not really that magic. So if you do standard error that action name, um, what Merv does is Merv tries to detect whether an action exists in the exceptions controller that matches. It's literally a six-line method. The last time I did, did this, somebody said, wow, Merv hates magic, and that seems really magical. And I literally pulled up the method, and it just does a recursive look for what things camel, camel um, underscored are inside of itself. Um, and returns nil if nothing is found. And so you can, this is sort of a way to do a, a, a rescue if you're not, since you're not in control of the stack, a rescue of everything. Um, but here's another problem. Let's say you're sending mail and your mailer errors out. It is its own error, right? Raise mailer error. Let's make a mailer error. So if you do that, the problem is, so this happens in Rails, and usually you just lose an exception. Go back to B. Instead of raising a not found, let's raise a standard error. Right, and standard error is going to go here, which is going to raise the mail error. So if that happens, you get an error stack. You get a two-dimensional, a three-dimensional <coughs> stack of the error. So the first thing that happened was you had the standard error, which is bad. And you can see the stack trace at that point. You can do the normal things that you normally do stack traces. And then after that, no mail was sent, and you can handle it here. So you can, do, you can use this to handle, if you have, for instance, an exception notifier, which we have, um, you can handle the case where there was an error in the mailer to do something else, like maybe dump it into a file called, you know, bad, super evil errors that I couldn't catch and send mail to. Because right? you don't want it just going to the log, you want it somewhere else that you can look at and be like, here are the things that I didn't get mailed at. Thank you. Um, so that's also cool. All right, what else? Does anyone else have anything they want to see before I move on? Better know. Okay, so what else can you do with Merv? So I'll show you our provide syntax. So in, in Rails and Merv, Rails has this thing called respond to, which looks something like this. You say respond to, to format, and you can do something like format.html and format.json, right? maybe like json some object. All right, so let's imagine we have an object. Right, and we'll give it a to json, which say, let's say returns Okay, so in Rails, this is I'm just um, compensating for the fact that I don't have like an ORM object here. So you might have something like you know something equals something dot new, and Rails would have this respond to block, and it would handle it correctly. But it turns out that you do this a lot. Um, anybody who does Rails apps here, which I've seen you do, uh, this pattern happens a lot, and you're constantly having to say well, if I want to accept JSON in this case, and if I want to accept HTML, and you're just doing the same thing over and over. 
and it's quasi dry because at least you don't have to have a case thing or something, but it's not really as dry as it could be. So what MERV does is MERV has something called provide. So you say in your class provides JSON and you don't have to say HTML. HTML is automatic. You can say it does not provide HTML if you want. But by default, by default we provide uh, HTML. So what, and then instead of saying render or something like that, you say display something. <coughs> and so we're in Lone Star and we have an index here. So the first thing that display something does, let's do, the first thing it does is it gets your content type. So let's start by assuming our, by the way, Merb will tell you if it tries to remove a constant. This is obviously um, pre the forking reloader and on Windows or some other platform that doesn't support fork. So if I go to Lone Star, we see this thing, something, right? So the first thing it does is it finds your content type. In this case, it's HTML, and it says, okay, try to find a template called index.html.erb, it found it. Let's do, so it found it, and so it ran it. But let's say I ask for JSON, I'm gonna start out JSON. Oh, I love Firefox. It's not any better. So that's the JSON that came down. So what this, so if it, so step one is it says, okay, what's my content type? If it's H, if in the case of HTML, it was HTML, it found the template, all was well, it just rendered the template. If it doesn't find the template, the next step is to attempt to um, look, try to call to JSON or to whatever on the thing. So this is the equivalent of render something or just something dot to JSON. Right, if I was to do this right, if I was to do that, now it's HTML and because Merb accepts strings, that's fine. Right? Um, so what display does is it encapsulates the pattern of that respond to blocks that Rails uses. Uh, the fact that what you almost always, I, what you pretty much always want is check to see if there's a template matching the content type. If so, render it. If there's no template, then don't, then call to something on it. And the two somethings are also just a layer of defaults that are provided by default in the bootloader, but you can add your own MIME types. Um, just looks like this. Merb.add mime, and you say like, you know, shockwave, uh, to shockwave, and then you provide a list of, you know, it's like application awesome, x shockwave or something. And this part over here tells it what you care about, um, what incoming accepts headers should match. This tells you what to call on it to Shockwave. And this tells you what to look for templates as. So it would look for index.shockwave.erb. Um, so what if you don't provide JSON and you ask for JSON? So it explodes with a 406 not acceptable, which is just coming here. So I can say, you know, 406 not acceptable. And then it will say for us it's not acceptable, right? So that's that goes back to the fact that you could you could capture you could catch exceptions. Um, another common question is okay, so let's say I have something like um, so if I have this and I say well 404 not found, right? And I go into Lone Star, let's say I raise uh, my SQL not found. So you would not want it to probably do this, right? 
because it's not the error. But so far, I've not shown you any way to um, disambiguate between that error and any other error because we only use the last part. Um, so we considered not only using the last part, but it seemed silly because it seemed like the number of cases where this would happen would be low compared to the utility of having short names. But you can just do def uh, self dot action name my SQL not found. <coughs> Right, and then it will work. Uh, that's because action name, again, is not anything magical. It's just a recursive lookup for uh, matching things in the exceptions controller. So if you override it to something special, it just works fine. It works just, just the way you want. Um, so what else? Ah, I'll show you action arts, which are cool. So what's an action arc? So let's say I have in my Lone Star thing, I actually want to take a parameter. Let's say I want it to, you know, params awesome. Right, and if I do this, I can do, you know, awesome equals Lone Star, and it will render it. That's the normal pattern that works just as well in Merb as it works in Rails. But Rail Merb also allows you to do this. It lets you specify it as a parameter. It even lets you do this. Um, and it does this using parse tree, which a lot of people think is crazy. But this is actually probably the most magical thing Merb does. And it does this because it provides a completely non-magical DSL, right? It provides a, a mechanism for you to treat your controllers as though they were really actually Ruby. And what does this do for testing, right? In testing, you can actually do this. Right, that'll work. Um, that seems well worth the fact that we're using parse tree. Um, and both Rubinius and JRuby have added to their implementations a non parse tree dependent version of .org. So the way, this, the way I would like this feature to exist if it was in Ruby is something like um, you'd be able to do method index.args. And it would return something like this. Um, and yes, I, I'm aware of the fact that if it was not a literal, that would pose some problems. But assu assuming it was limited to literals, which is the only case I actually care about, um, something like this would be cool. And that's, in fact, the API that we provide using parse tree, and that's the API that is provided using Rubinius and JRuby, which is cool. OK. So um, you, one thing that we do that sort of departs from Ruby a little, the Ruby's normal behavior a little bit, is that we do this. So let's say x y equals hello, z equals one star. And let's say we did um, so first of all, if you provide no sorry, if you provide no parameters in this case, it returns a bad request, which basically means um, you try you try to call the method using without an x, but Ruby requires an x. So there's a required parameter here called x. You didn't provide one, so boom, bad request, which is an HTTP error. So if I do like x equals whatever, right, then it works fine, right? What is not intuitive, and it's again, a departure from Ruby, is that if I do this, it actually, the middle, it's able to call this leaving the middle default there, but overriding this one. That's just because of the way we do the lookup and um, the way we do the sends. We actually just explicitly say, okay, we know what the default is, so we'll send that in this case. Um, we struggled with whether or not this made sense uh, because 
seems like it should just do what Ruby does, but it turned out that it's extremely common to have option, optional things, and because we don't have to worry about the normal keyword arguments problem, right? We have normally Ruby has no way of specifying keyword arguments, so you know, sorry, you're out of luck. But in our case, we do have a way of specifying them, so we implement this as though there were keyword arguments. Cool. All right. Any questions? Do I not? Yes, sir. Ah, okay. So we support, so if you do, ah, okay. There's two questions that you're, there's a sort of two questions you're asking. One of them is just in general, how do we handle JavaScript, like returning JavaScript back? First of all, I'm, as a person that does a lot of JavaScript, I'm uncomfortable with the way Rails does it, namely actually sending back JavaScript to be eval because it seems like sending back stuff from the server to be eval on the client side is bad. Like e the, the eval keyword is used on the client side to eval things, which means that you're causing like this trust barrier that seems dangerous. And I just, I try to avoid having eval arbitrary strings in my code in JavaScript. That just seems like a bad idea. Um, but, so you can do something like provides JS, right? And then you can do, you know, And then you could have you could potentially have it do like, you know, alert awesome. This is not gonna work because like I said, there's no eval rigged up on the other end. So I think it'll just probably return a string. Yeah. Um, so it just works the same way anything would work. By the way, in my in this demo here, I'm sort of cheating by appending dot js or .json or .whatever. Um, that's because if you, you, like in Rails, if you do .js or .json or .whatever, it'll automatically win out over any content type that's provided by the accept header. But if you do provide, if you, if you do this, but you send in an accept header, for instance, if you're JavaScript or a web service, we handle that just fine. And that's handled using the list of accept, accept headers that are provided by AdMaya. Does that answer your question? People tend to write JavaScript. Um, my 30 second spiel on this is, if you're a web company that has any kind of significant app and you don't have somebody on board that knows JavaScript, you're silly. Uh, it's like not knowing, having anyone on board that knows HTML. So it's a core web language. Presumably you have a team of some people. Finding someone that knows Ruby and JavaScript isn't that hard. So just do it. If you look at 37 Signals, which sort of popularized RJS, has a ton of custom JavaScript. Right, so RJS is cool, but they end up writing a ton of JavaScript on their own anyway, because it's just not hot. Like, Rails is like a, is a, it's an 80-20 solution that is actually one of their worst getting to 80% things ever. And then if you, in fact, do use it, at some point in your life, you're going to be hitting a weekend, and they'll be like, oh my god, I have to actually know JavaScript, but I don't actually know any JavaScript. So time to learn JavaScript over a weekend. It's not ideal. Um, basically, just gets, make sure you have someone on your team that knows JavaScript. All will be well. Other questions? Yes. Yes. So actually, this is a good opportunity to announce something. So Merb typically starts up at around 20 megabytes for like these processes. Um, there's a site uh, that ha had been running Merb for so a four, on a 40 megabyte footprint, running a few, th three or four engine yard slices. It was getting like seven million hits a day, and it, I don't know, probably had a couple dozen MERBs total on those four slices. Slices normally hold like three Rails instances, so you could just pack more of them inside. Um, but the announcement is, so I don't know if you guys noticed, but if you require Ruby gems and then require any gem, Ruby gems requires the entire Ruby gems repository into your system. And that could be a lot of RAM. So just to illustrate. 
So here I am in IRB, and that's here I'm in IRB, and it's four megabytes. And let's require Ruby gems, and all is still going to be well. I already required Ruby gems actually. That's fine. But now let's say I require something small like JSON. First of all, did you notice that perceptible pause there? And let's look at it now. 9.9 .9 megabytes. So what happened there? Uh, what happened there is that that pause was Ruby loading in the gem index into memory. And that really sucks. Um, and that is actually the reason why any Ruby process involving gems that you run doesn't start up instantaneously. I can do like Ruby minus E, puts awesome. That will be instant. Right? And I think that's actually like a mission of Ruby is to be able to do that instantaneously or perceptibly instantaneously. But once you add Ruby gems, automatically there's like a pause. And that is actually unnecessary. So what we have done um, is we're releasing a gem called Mini Gem, which is just, all it does is allows you to, instead of requiring Ruby gems, you require a Mini Gem. And it will, it does what Ruby 1.9 has, something called Gem Prelude, um, which mocks out a lot of uh, the Ruby gems methods lets you say, still say gem, blah, blah, blah. We'll still load everything. It still adds stuff to the load path, but it tries its darndest not to load Ruby gems ever because Ruby gems is huge. Um, by the way, I don't have that many gems on my system. If you have a lot more gems than I do, it, that number will be bigger. It'll be like 30 megabytes possibly your process randomly. Um, the reason we didn't just use gem prelude is that gem prelude um, works to avoid, if I just, so, Gem Prelude was written so that in Ruby 1.9 that's still instantaneous, right? Because Ruby 1.9 has required Ruby gems in it, and so they didn't want to have it explode. So it does sort of defer, but Gem Prelude falls back to Ruby gems way too often. So, for instance, if you do in Ruby, if you do like gem JSON bigger equals to 0 0.5 or something like that, that works. Um, you don't have to do this. Uh, in Gem Prelude, uh, the first one will trigger a requiring of the entire RubyGems library. So there's a bunch of cases like that, and so instead of trying to figure out how to fix Gem Prelude so that it would not, so that it would work for all cases, we just basically rewrote it. Um, we did something a little bit differently in that we require Gem version. So Gem Prelude has like a method that takes a, takes a string and makes a version out of it, which is an array which seems silly since gem version isn't very large. It's like a K or something and has all the functionality. And so we did that a few times. Um, we also require the gem specification of any gem you actually load, which is again very small so that we don't have to guess about where to require files from, which is still possible using gem prelude. Um, but yeah, it's cool. And it's gonna be released soonish, like this week probably. Cool, yes. So I have one minute, so I don't think demonstrating is impossible. Plus, I gave a talk about jQuery this morning, but I can tell you the answer, which is it's not any different from using jQuery with Rails. Um, jQuery has get and post helpers, get and post things, and Ajax. And if you just say dollar dot get some URL. Um, provide a callback, it will hit Merv with the URL, go through the router, then you, prob you probably want to have it ask for JSON. So jQuery has like dollar dot get JSON, um, some URL, function, JSON, put stuff in there. And what you want to do is, let's say we did like Lone Star. The URL is actual uh, CGI or exact controller? It's like the URL you would put in the browser. So if let's say I did Lone Star Index, for instance, uh -huh. with get JSON, it'll, uh, it'll actually, so it'll go to Lone Star RB, and if I say provides JSON and do display something, it'll return back to jQuery a JSON object, and which will be available as, you know, J what do we have there, awesome. So it'll be available as json.awesome inside of here, <laughs> which is pretty much all the, as far as I'm concerned, all the integration that I need. That pretty much lets you pass Ruby hashes directly down to JavaScript um, seamlessly in that. I do a lot of it, it works well for me. Cool. Okay. No problem.
video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.